So, today I am coming at you with a bit of a book review. Many of you will have heard of Peter Singer, um, and I suppose a fair number of you will have read his 70s work, uh, Animal Liberation. I myself read Animal Liberation quite some time ago, um, and I would credit that with being the book that inspired me to go vegan, uh, simply based on the harrowing account of what animals truly endure in the animal agricultural industry. There were um, issues relating to, well I was already vegetarian when I read it, but there were issues relating to uh, what we do to obtain other animal derived products that I was not aware of at the time, um, and upon learning that information in the book um, I was adequately persuaded that I should no more do so. Um, I did actually read the book at the same time as Tom Regan's book, uh, Case for Animal, uh, A Case for Animal Rights, um, but technically I read Singers first and I'd already made my mind up before I moved on to Tom's book, so I'm sure it would have had the same effect the other way around. But what I'm reviewing today is neither of those books, but Peter Singer's newest book, Why Vegan? It was published this year in, oh sorry, last year in 2020. So Why Vegan contains a collection of articles that, that Singer has wrote throughout the years uh, on the subject of animal rights and veganism. Um, so that includes a uh, two articles from the 70s uh, surrounding the book Animal Liberation and the next, and then uh, just a couple throughout the year, throughout his career. Um, the next is An Ethical Way of Treating Chickens, which, oh boy, is that upsetting. And I think it's quite an essential read. Um, because the detail that it contains, it's a very educational piece, but it's, uh, it's, it is horrifying, and it's horrifying by the nature of, uh, what happens to chickens is horrifying. There's no way of really describing it honestly without being a bit horrifying. Um, so within this particular essay, Singer outlines the um, reality of what we know about what chickens experience in the case that they do indeed suffer and have the capacity to do so, that they are complex individuals that we're putting through these scenarios, and then he goes on to, exp uh, to describe um, the actual circumstances in which they live, which is, I mean, it's heartbreaking. I, I mean, you'd have to be a monster to read that and not have to just pause and stare into void for a little bit. And he then goes on to describe the, or within it, he captures the problem that the demand for significant output, um, that capitalism and efficiency drive, and it's horrifying. I keep saying that, but it is horrifying. Uh, take this section, for example, he describes an account uh, from a conversation with someone who's worked at a um, slaughterhouse that served Kentucky Fried Chicken, they describe that uh, we're killing 80,000 chickens a night, mostly for Kentucky Fried Chicken, says that what we have described doesn't even come close to the horrors I have seen. The killing line on which we worked, on which he worked, moved so quickly that it was impossible to kill all the chickens before the line moved on. On a good night, he says, about one in every seven of the chickens were alive when they went into the scolding tank. The scolding tank is where um, their feathers are removed in a boiling vat. On an average night, it might be three chickens in every ten. The missed birds are, according to Butler, scolded alive. They flop, scream, kick and their eyeballs pop out of their heads. Often they come out with broken bones and disfigured and missing body parts because they've struggled so much in the tank. When there were mechanical failures, the supervisor would refuse to stop the line even though he knew that chickens were going into the scolding tank alive or were having their legs broken by malfunctioning equipment. This is an unacceptable horror show. And that is what heavy demand drives. 
I do think that's um, a very emotional but essential read. We all need to know these things, especially if you're going to eat the bodies of chickens. Uh, the next essay is um, a personal account of his experience um, of what drove him towards the case of animal rights to begin with um, and the vegetarians that he associated with in his early days in Oxford in the 70s when he first, when the movement as we know it today was being defined by the actions of people back then. Uh, and that's an interesting uh, bit of history to the cause. Um, quite enjoyed that. And the next, uh, the next essay we have is a vegetarian philosophy, which contains some quite interesting information about past. Uh, there's a, a lot on the McLibel case, which you may be familiar with. Um, and it also contains a recipe for doll, which is great. Um, the next essay, If Fish Could Scream, um, is another one that I strongly recommend everyone read. I think even in, even amongst vegans, the plight of fish, although obviously we don't abuse fish, I think the plight of fish is under-discussed. Um, if you close your eyes and try to imagine animal suffering, or if you try to imagine the problems with animal consumption, we're probably nearly all imagining a similar looking shed or warehouse or slaughterhouse and it's just um, not descriptive of the reality for fish and that's that's fine though I mean what, what those animals experience is a very real and endured suffering and they do so on a mass scale but um, there really isn't the number of fish that are killed is in the trillions per year and that's so unfathomable you kind of can't put the image in your head aside from the sheer volume the brutality that they endure is again uh, extreme and I think I think we you know we overlook how extreme that is singer here describes fish caught in nets by trawlers are dumped on board a ship and allowed to suffocate impaling live bait on hooks that's other fish, that's live bait on hooks, is a common commercial pr practice. Long line fishing, for example, uses hundreds or even thousands of hooks on a single line that may be 50 to 100 kilometres long. When fish take the bait, they are likely to remain caught for many hours before the line is hauled in. So that is fish hanging as bait for hours on end in their hundreds to a line, then catching fish who hang by their wounds from those hooks, who are then hauled in and suffocate. This is um, <clears throat> this is a standard of slaughter that we that we I mean we don't accept for any other animals. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are the scenario that we described with the chickens is barbaric, but that's sort of a failure of process. Killing them at all is barbaric, but that's a failure of process that causes that kind of um, horror show. But in the case of fish, there just isn't regulation to protect them. Now this is a problem that I have sometimes. Uh, the conclusion that this essay comes to, it, um, so, the th so the thing with reading Singer's work is I generally think he's quite right on, <laughs> and he shares a lot of great information, um, and it's a good read in general. I sort of have this feeling that I'm uh, standing behind daddy's legs, <laughs> peering out from behind him going, yeah, you, you tell him daddy. Um, but then sometimes daddy says something a bit weird that I don't quite agree with. Um, I think, oh, daddy. <laughs> Daddy's a bit out of touch sometimes. Or he, he, he seems to think very much about the suffering and the experience at the time and um, at, at some, so sometimes I think his conclusions come up a little bit softer than I particularly like them to be. Like he goes through and explains so much, um, and it just takes you along with him. But then to come to a conclusion, after all that that I've taken in about fish, the conclusion that we need to learn how to capture and kill wild fish humanely, or if that's not possible to find less cruel and more sustainable alternatives to eating them, is a bit short for me. Um, I mean, it doesn't need that first bit of the sentence, it should just be, 
find less cruel and more sustainable alternatives to eating fish. I mean, he, uh, the, the illusion there might be that uh, there is no such thing, it isn't possible to capture and kill wild fish humanely, but it suggests that there is such a thing as humane killing and that just... Uh, Fair Daddy really uh, drops the ball and is a bit disappointing. But I mean, I'm not I'm not really having a dig at him or anything. I have a lot of respect for his work and what he's done for this movement, and he is a defining character and an early mover. And sometimes the early movers do kind of get left behind in their way of thinking. But that's uh, that's that's not for me. I'm not. That really falls short of justice. Uh, next essay that he writes is a case for going vegan, which um, kind of plays off the vegetarian idea to say, well, if uh, vegetarians have a problem with animals being killed, then what of what remains? Is that ethical or not? And in general, he comes to the conclusion that no, it's not. We're doing really horrible things. <laughs> Again, the uh, conclusion doesn't land where I want it to be. Um, he asks the question, is there an ethical way of eating animal products? And then concludes that it is possible to obtain meat, eggs and dairy products from animals who have been treated less cruelly, allowed to eat grass rather than grain or soy. And he kind of implies that doing this might not be, might, well, might not be so cruel. And I really don't want to misquote him here, he says so if, and it is um, an emphasised if, so if there is no serious ethical objection to killing animals so long as they have had good lives, then being selective about the animal products you eat could provide an ethically defensible diet. It needs care, however. Organic, for instance, says little about animal welfare and hence blah blah blah. He says that going vegan is a simpler choice that sets a clear-cut example for others to follow. So his conclusion is that one should go vegan, but um, again, it's a very soft landing after the content that I've read. <laughs> Um, the idea that, well, there is a theoretical, ethical way of doing things is kind of an, ina an inadequate conclusion, because the answer is, let's stop exploiting animals, <laughs> what gives you the right? Um, and it's, I don't know, it, it, when, when you think about a scenario where we're ethically treating all the animals, especially compared against the demand that people have, um, I mean, it's silliness. You, it, it, it's a really, it's a really silly idea. But um, even so, the answer is uh, leave them alone. <laughs> so, Daddy disappoints. I'm going to stop calling him Daddy. I really don't know why that's coming from. <laughs> Any psychologists, please? Uh... Look, it's been a long pandemic. Maybe I just miss my dad. <laughs> uh, the next essay is one about cultured meat saving the planet. And here we're, we're into very modern times talking about the potential of alternative to meat products and synthetic meats. But this really tripped me up because it starts with, in September, California Governor Jerry Brown signed a bill mandating that in, by 2045 all California electricity will come from clean power sources. And that really messed with my head because I was thinking, Jerry Brown was the governor of California back in the 70s. Um, and I know this via the Dead Kennedy song. <laughs> California River Alice. Um, um, and so I was thinking, man, how ahead of the game was Governor Jerry Brown? And then I was thinking he was talking about cultured meat, so it's it's now, it's now. It goes on to talk about the early 2020s, and, and I, 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 like my mind was just in pieces. And then I realised, Jerry Brown's governor again. <laughs> he was governor in the 70s, and he's governor when this uh, back when this essay was wrote. Uh, anyway, what a weird bookend. The stuff at the beginning. <laughs> The stuff at the beginning of this book would have been approximately the time when Jerry Brown was governor, and the stuff at the end is too. What's going on? Jerry Brown, where were you during the 2006 essays about chickens? I want receipts. Anyway, next essay is The Two Dark Sides of Covid, where um, Singer analyses the effect of both wet markets and animal agriculture in general and their role in uh, 
spreading zoonotic disease, the risk of the future and what we need to do differently. It's only a short essay, but very relevant, very recent. Um, and that's that. I recommend this book. It's a short read and it's got a lot of great information in it. I strongly recommend, or the ones that affected me the most were the piece on chickens and the piece on fish. Um, so I strongly recommend those to anyone, whether you're vegan or not. Um, I think, especially in the case of the fish, because I don't think we, I don't think even amongst vegans we talk about it enough. If you look at any ex-vegan first weaning themselves back onto animal products, they all seem to think they're doing the least amount of harm by um, ripping fish's bodies from the waters and shoveling them into their mouths. I think we need to challenge that attitude. We're not saying enough on the pro topic. We're not doing enough, really, to pay respect to what fish go to. Um, I think everyone should be reading that. Uh, I think I think we all need to kind of get a grip on the extent of fish suffering. If you do want to read it, then great, go get the book. Um, personally, I strongly disapprove of Amazon for a number of reasons in the same family of behaviours. So, I mean, you do the best with the choices that you have available to you. I'm not going to judge you if Amazon is all that you have. Um, if you can support local bookshops though, rather than allowing Amazon to just completely dominate and steal the market from them, um, then please support a local bookshop. If you're not aware of them, then there is a great online bookshop, because I know, I know it's hard to get out to them at the moment during the current nightmare that we're all living in. Um, in the UK, bookshops are closed at the moment, um, as they're not essential. And also, anyway, if you're going to local bookshops, you don't necessarily have a broad choice. Uh, but you can go to bookshop.org. Uh, bookshop.org is um, kind of set up in order to compete with Amazon and it's a place where you can support local bookshops by shopping online. There are loads and loads of local bookshops that are all a part of this organisation uh, that benefit when you shop for books there. Um, I've set up sort of a bit of a shop on there so you can go into my shop and see sort of books that I recommend and this will be in there. You've no obligation to do so. I do think the best thing to do is to support a physical bookshop if you can, um, but if you can't support physical bookshops, bookshop.org is surely a better choice than Amazon because the more you shop at Amazon you give a little bit more of a market to them and they're already way too big and they've shown us what they will do, they've shown us where they invest, they've shown us where they take, they've shown us what they think about uh, treatment of humans that they employ. In, in fact, the ways that Amazon exploit people go beyond what they do to their workers. Amazon exploits independent sellers on their platform. Um, there have been cases of people selling uh, their own wares that they've created, which Amazon then observe, uh, that, oh, money's being made on this product, so they just snatch it and make their own version, undercut them, and then drive someone out of business. Um, there was a bit of a horror show a while ago where Amazon failed to correctly list uh, the prices of a number of items and they made their independent sellers bear the cost of that. Um, Amazon are destroying diversity in the market and it's terrifying. I don't support Amazon. If you do, that's your business, I suppose, but I'd encourage you to, you know, I, th I think we need to be considering our consumption across the board and uh, I won't stand for it anymore, Amazon. I'm coming for you with bookshop.org and we're gonna take books back. For people who care about books. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's what I'm doing anyway. But yeah, I'll probably update that list. At the moment it's just got a couple of things on there that kind of I've read either recently or were near to me on my bookcase or... <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll probably do a bit of an essential read list at some point. It's a bit of a mess at the moment, but... <laughs>